Hi, everyone. As you can tell by my casual haircut and my jeans, I either work for a nonprofit or a tech company. And in this case, it's both. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that intersection and why I think it's really important and a way and a direction for the nonprofit space to move. So Crisis Text Line is the largest organization in the US for people in crisis. We're 24 seven and we're national for any crisis that a texter is facing. And our crises are severe. So over a third of our texters are experiencing suicidal ideation. I'm gonna tell you a little bit about how we got started. Then I'm gonna talk about one example of how we're using data to make us better as an organization. And then some principles to take away from that for how social good is created. I think both for the nonprofit space and the foundations that fund us. So Crisis Text Line was born from another organization, another nonprofit called DoSomething.org, which is the largest organization in the US for young people and social change. So back in 2010, I was working there as a data scientist. The founder of Crisis Text Line, Nancy Lublin, was the CEO of DoSomething.org. They run campaigns like the peanut butter jam slam. So this raises over a million pounds of peanut butter and jelly for food pantries around the country every year. And you can be Team Crunchy or Team Smooth. I'm on Team Crunchy. So DoSomething.org runs these campaigns all by the medium that young people use and trust, texting. But what started happening back in 2010 was we started receiving out of flow messages. So people who texted us who were volunteers, but were experiencing bullying and didn't know what to do, or were thinking about coming out as gay. Or one message that came in and prompted us to actually think about the need for a crisis service prompted Nancy to start Crisis Text Line. I'm not going to quote the exact message because it's very intense but there was a girl who was being raped and didn't know how to get out of the situation. We passed her information to the Rape Abuse Incest National Network, but it was a phone baseline. We also sent back the phone number to the texter, but we never heard back. So this is when Nancy decided to start Crisis Text Line, that there had to be a service for people in crisis on the medium that they use and trust the most. And so she hired myself, and our chief technology officer as the first two employees. And I think we were the East Coast version of what is a West Coast startup. So on the West Coast, you start up in a garage. In New York, we don't have garages. <laughs> so we went to the corner of a friend's office and coded in the corner for about six months and then launched Crisis Text Line in August of 2013. We launched quietly in two markets. We went to Chicago and El Paso and texted about 4,000 members from DoSomething.org in each market to seed the idea. Within four months, we were in every area code in the US. And so here's where we are today. We have 3,700 crisis counselor volunteers around the country. They go through a 35-hour online training, and you can too, so happy to talk to you afterwards about that. And then they commit four hours a week for a year volunteering to support texters in crisis. Since the start, we've exchanged over 65 million messages now with texters in crisis, and we're going to double that number this year alone. In terms of the impact that we're having, this is the number of active rescues that we've done to date. An active rescue is when we send out emergency services to intervene in an active suicide attempt. We're doing over 20 of these a day right now. And I think one of the most exciting parts for me personally is that we're serving a population that is not being served by any other resource. Two thirds of our texters mention something that they've never shared with anyone else. One in five texters come from the 10% lowest income zip codes. And another one I'll mention here is the 5% of our textures that identify as American Indian, that's three times the percent of the US population. It's also the highest risk demographic for a suicide attempt. 
So let me tell you about one example of how we're using data and the power of those 65 million messages to improve our service. So one of the best and most challenging parts of Crisis Text Line is that over 80% of our traffic comes from organic sharing. People who have used our service, who love our service, and then want to share about it on Facebook, on Tumblr, uh, anywhere on social media. For example, last November, we had a spike from a post that went viral on Facebook, and we saw 4x volume for a week. So what that means is, one, we don't have to pay anything for marketing, and it's the best form of marketing. It's people who love our service. So that's the great side. The challenging side is it means our demand is incredibly uneven. So we have spikes in volume, and we have to respond accordingly to staff up. So this speaks to our queuing system. So sometimes you, have, you do have to wait to be connected with a crisis counselor. Most organizations that have queuing systems think about queuing in terms of chronology. So you get answered in the order in which you come into the queue. We believe from the very beginning that we should think differently, that we should handle the queue based on severity, not chronology. So our highest risk texters go number one in the queue. And I actually believe that almost all queuing systems should work this way. For example, anybody who is struggling with flight changes or travel changes over the last few days, it would kill me if somebody was uh, you know, making changes for Thanksgiving or Fourth of July ahead of you in the queue. So severity, not chronology. And what we can do, and I'll tell you what we did do, so version one of a queuing system based on severity, we looked at the academic literature. We looked for common words associated with suicide. So words like die, cut, overdose. We just put together a simple list of 50 words and then said, if these appear in the first message sent by the texter, move them to number one in the queue. Worked pretty well. So we were able to identify over half of these high-risk texters, which just makes up 0.6% of our overall population, so it's a very small group. We were, we were able to find over half of those based on the first message using this simple model. We were able to reach them in an average of 39 seconds. But there were a few complications and things that we were missing. So for example, the first two of these that you see, I don't want to die, our, our key was flagging these as high risk because the word die appeared or the word kill appeared and moving them up, and it was missing things where there wasn't an explicit mention of a word related to suicide, in the case of the last one there, on ibuprofen. So we knew we could do better, and this is where the power of our data came into play. So we launched a version two of this algorithm. And this one was based on the corpus of data, the 65 million messages. So we identified over 10,000 unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams of words that were a better indicator of a suicide risk attempt than the word suicide in itself. And we used this, uh, what's called a deep neural net, to power this algorithm and identify these words and phrases. We moved from 53% identified based on that first message up to 86% where we are now and still getting to them in an average of 39 seconds. So what are some of these words? So it's words like military. If that word is used, that texter has a 2x risk of ending up in a suicide risk, a high risk suicide attempt versus using the word suicide on its own. One that really surprised me, the crying face emoticon, that has an 11 times higher risk than the word suicide in itself. And up at the top of the heap are words like excedrin, and ibuprofen, these have a 15 times higher risk of ending up in an act of rescue than the word suicide in itself. So over-the-counter over common household drugs, even words like CVS where people buy these things is up at the top of the heap. So this is the power of 65 million messages that we can find 86% of our high-risk texters based on their first message alone. So I think there are three implications here for the broader space, the broader world, and particularly nonprofits and foundations. So this changes, I think, how nonprofits should think about how they're built, 
from the ground up around data and technology, how foundations fund in terms of funding to support tech and data informed nonprofits, and also how CSR thinks in terms of what organizations they partnership. So one thing that we do differently is we don't think of ourselves primarily as a mental health organization. We think of ourselves primarily as a tech organization. And so what that means concretely is that most organizations think about people, then policy, then product as a way of solving problems, meaning people first. So when you have a problem, you staff up against it. The problem is this doesn't scale. It's very expensive, and if you're an organization working nationally, it's really hard to keep up demand, especially in a cost-effective way. So we do the opposite. We do product, then policy, then people. The code orange algorithm, or the, what I call code orange, the triage algorithm that I mentioned earlier is an example of that. We originally, even before that V1, we had our counselors looking to see which was the highest risk conversation. We knew that wasn't sustainable and we were going to move away from it. And actually based on that move alone, so taking away the responsibility from the crisis counselor, we were able to drop our wait times in our queue by 40% across the board. Not just for our high risk texters, but taking the urgency and the effort off of the counselor's plate to triage meant they could focus on handling the conversations instead. So that's the power of product, then policy, then people. The second learning is this, most nonprofits start with a service and then build tech on top. This allows for what I call 10% gains. When you already have the frame of your building or the frame of your organization, when you start to add on top of it, you get 10% gains, but you can't change the fundamental structure. And so tech becomes a way to create nice to have gains in efficiency or effectiveness. We went the opposite. We started with myself and then our chief technology officer, and we put ourselves in the position of creating 10x gains. So we are now 440 times bigger of a service in terms of the demand that we're handling than we were in our first month. And the only way we can keep up with that kind of scale is because we built from the ground up around data and technology. The third le learning is how funders fund us. We are really lucky, this is very rare, but our funders do not give us restricted funding. They don't say, this money is for this program that you're running. Instead, they say, you know what to do with this. You know best. And it gives us the ability to pivot and iterate and improve on our programs in a way that being locked in couldn't. And what's more fun fundamental to a tech company than continuous iteration? So it gives us the flexibility to create algorithms like that text or triage algorithm and improve on the model that we already had. So I'll close by saying the most important thing, which is if you do know somebody who could benefit from this service and who might need us, the number is 741-741, and we're available 24-7. Thank you very much.